We're live. As many of you know, September is PBC Awareness Month, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our 2020 PBC Speaker Series tonight. Those of you who have attended past PBC events in Toronto or Victoria may already be familiar with our, tonight's very special guest speakers. I'd like to welcome Dr. J.P. Wallach from the University of British Columbia, who will discuss PBC prevalence and incidents, and Dr. Aliyah Ghulam Hussein from the University of Toronto, who will discuss PBC risk factors and phenotypes. Now, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Wallach. Okay, so, sorry, I'm just trying, I have to hit share, I guess. Is that right? Oh, how Check do I? screen and make Sorry? it big. Share your screen and make it. Uh... Yeah, I'm trying to, it's giving me, it says share link, but I don't know if that's, it doesn't seem to want to share. Um, oh, do I, oh, do I share it? Oh, sorry, I share it through here. That's why, my mistake. Got it. And can everybody see that now? Yes. Okay. So thank you to Gail and the organizers for um, having me uh, participate. And thank you to everybody out there uh, in internet land for taking your time to, to be with us today. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I'm supposed to talk about the impact of geography on PPC, but I can't help but uh, also mention heritage as well because the two are uh, inextricably linked, at least at this point in our understanding of the disease. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, I just put that there uh, just for, um, just to be comprehensive. And so the, what we're gonna do over the next uh, 20 minutes, which I have to uh, be on time for, is explore the uh, complex epidemiology uh, of PBC, both macro and micro, try to uh, isolate groups that might be disproportionately affected by this condition, and to try and explain some of these disparities. And I say explain and not answer because, spoiler alert, we don't have the answers, at least not yet. Before I get to the um, geography, I really want to touch upon the, the uh, inheritance. And there's very little, uh, there's, there's very little like using the gold standard of identical twin studies to show that there is inheritability for certain conditions in medicine. And PBC actually has a fairly high uh, twin rate, here mentioned as the monozygote concordance rate, um, higher than other autoimmune conditions that also are known to have inheritable uh, factors such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, multiple sclerosis. There are also increased risk of uh, chromosomal defects um, in uh, PBC patients, such as the loss of the Y chromosome in red cell in red blood cells, and uh, sometimes the presence of just of just one, not two X chromosomes in females in the white blood cells. Again, we don't know why this is necessarily happening, but it's still interesting uh, to point out. Uh, I apologize if this is a bit muddled on your respective screens, but this is sort of, this is a systematic review that essentially looks at the epidemiology to this point across every country that's done a large uh, study on PBC. If I can draw your attention to the third and fourth columns, so the middle two columns, the third is country and the fourth is prevalence per million, and prevalence per million is the metric we're going to use uh, over and over again uh, during this talk. You can generally see that the prevalence is uh, fairly similar for most of the countries documented there. Um, Canada is sort of in the middle, not outstandingly high or low. It's important to note that in this study, uh, Canada is being referenced solely from Alberta data. So this is not actual Canadian data. This is just from a, a study long ago, uh, just from Alberta. But um, for, this meta for this systematic review, they reference it as Canada. What you do see from this, uh, from that column though, is that uh, on the low side, Australia is incredibly low in prevalence compared to other countries, as is Hong Kong and South Korea. And I'm gonna talk about Australia uh, in just a minute. So this is the sort of 30,000 foot view as I like to call it. It gives you a little bit of an overview, but unless you uh, take a deep dive and get granular, you're, we're not able to learn more about who might be at increased risk or for what reasons. So I'm gonna start with Australia, specifically the region of Australia that's, that's Victoria. So this is the same study uh, that I was just referencing before. In it though, the actual rate of PBC in Australian born people was lower than what was documented on that last slide. And the reason for that is 
the actual documented rate for the entire for the entire region was augmented by immigrants from Europe. Specifically, there you can see on the left side of the screen, uh, people who came from the UK, from Italy and Greece, their prevalence um, much higher than it was for native-born Australians, and. This is a very rough data. It's you can't really make any can't draw really strong conclusions from this, but it's still fun to speculate um, and at least theorize. And if you look on the right side where the bar graph is, what that shows on the, the left bar is Australian born women older than 40. The middle bar is UK born immigrants to Australia, uh, UK born women living in Australia. And the third uh, bar, the highest bar, is UK women still living in the United Kingdom. So from there, we can perhaps speculate, and again, speculate the operative word, that uh, there may be a, an effect where if you're coming from the United Kingdom, you're still at higher risk, even if you move to a new land. So does this mean that a region uh, geography doesn't play a stronger role as genetics? Maybe, maybe not. More really needs to be done in this area. But again, it, we answer one question, we get a whole bunch more. Um, if we take out immigration, we can look at a study done on the uh, Greek Isle of Crete. The reason I mentioned if we take out immigration is because Crete is an isle with roughly 600,000 people, and it's a fairly ethnically homogenous population. There's a very little, there's not a lot of diversity there, and there's also very little immigration. So that it's interesting to study this group because then you can you can get rid of those two potential variables, and in doing so, uh, there was one reference hospital for all 600,000 people. And so all the data went through one hospital. So again, consistency and uh, the same people always managing the data. And they found that despite there being a lack of migration and a lack of culture and a lack of ethnic diversity, there were indeed pockets of areas, uh, indeed areas that had pockets of PBC at much higher densities than others. Those two pictures on the left, the darker colors are higher concentrations of PBC, whereas the lighter colors are lesser concentrations. When they did advanced mathematical modeling, which is the black and white graph on the right, they found that they were able to predict that future cases of PPC would likely come from certain regions as well, as illustrated by the darker areas. I can't explain how they came to that conclusion, and nowhere in the, nowhere in the research does it um, have an explanation for why cases are um, isolated more in certain areas than others. But now, we can, but now we have at least an example of showing that it doesn't always have to come down to um, ethnic uh, diversity uh, to explain away some of the differences. So what could be some of the environmental factors? Well, there's an old study from New York City uh, that just looked at transplanted patients. So this is very old data. And they just looked at PVC transplanted patients and they tied them to their zip codes. And then they separated, uh, separated out all the data uh, based on the borough of New York City. And they found that Mo the, there were one and a half times as many cases of PBC on Staten Island as any other borough in New York City. And interestingly, Staten Island had six times as many what are called super fun sites. Actually, that means toxic waste dumps. There were six times as many uh, toxic dumps in Staten Island compared to any of the other boroughs. So could there be something seeping into the groundwater perhaps causing an increased risk? Again, maybe this hasn't been followed up to look for that causation, but it's again, interesting to speculate that there may be an environmental factor. Another place that uh, shows possible environmental factors was an old study done in Nagasaki, Japan. This was of nearly 18,000 uh, people who were um, survivors of the uh, atomic bomb going off at the end of World War II. All of the people involved in this study were live and present in the city when the bomb went off. And what they found was of the 18,000 surveyed and studied, um, no one, nobody who was more than six kilometers from the center of the blast developed PVC. All the cases happened for people who were within six kilometers. And I realize this is a very uh, busy slide, so I'm sorry, but if you look at the first row, which is distance from the center, so that tells you, right, but within two kilometers, between two and six, and greater than six, and look at the very bottom, uh, which is percent positive, and that it's misleading. It doesn't just refer to the antimitochondrial antibody, which is what it suggests above. It actually is confirmation with biopsy if necessary. But you can see here that, you know, there was a, again, no cases outside of six kilometers of the center, quite a, a fair number of cases inside of six kilometers and inside of two kilometers, an even higher rate of PVC. So could nuclear radiation play a role 
as a potential environmental factor. Again, maybe. Now we go back to, now that we've traveled around the world, let's take us uh, to our backyard into Canada. And again, I'm giving you the 30,000 foot view. Uh, this is from data done by uh, Dr. Yoshida and other hepatologists across the country two years ago um, in poster form. And you can see here the prevalence rates for the regions of Canada, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, combined with Manitoba, Ontario, and then the Maritimes. Sadly, the territories in Quebec were excluded from this. Um, but you can see that the prevalence rates are relatively similar across the board with some increase. Uh, you can see that the Maritimes being the highest. And the likely reason for the Maritimes being the highest is, is, is for the same reasons we saw in the Australian information I showed you before, which has to do with migration, specifically what we call the founder effect. The Maritimes has the highest concentration of immigrants or descendants of immigrants from the United Kingdom versus anywhere in the country. And we know there's a fixed uh, prevalence through much of the United Kingdom. And um, considering that otherwise in the Maritimes, the populations are uh, essentially Western, Caucasian with little other variability, this appears to be the, the, the best explanation why so far the prevalence is a little bit higher there uh, than anywhere else in the country. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that over time, not just in Canada, but uh, around the world, uh, prevalence rates of PBC rose dramatically. If you look at the graph on the bottom right there, um, Canada is referenced, by the way, by the uh, orange triangles and the orange line towards the far right. Um, <clears throat> the prevalence rates for all countries studied rose dramatically uh, during that uh, time span. Now, is this because PBC just happens to be occurring more naturally now? Or is it because we're becoming better, becoming more adept at identifying and detecting it? I think the answer is the latter, and that can be explained by other data from the same uh, from the same paper, showing that as the prevalence in Canada rose uh, from one year to the next, the rate of transplant drop, the prevalence of transplant for PPC dropped uh, significantly. So that means not only are we detecting more cases, but we're detecting them sooner and therefore getting people on treatment sooner and avoiding the eventual outcome of requiring a transplant. Uh, from the same uh, physician, Dr. Yoshida, a transplant hepatologist here at Vancouver, in Vancouver, Vancouver General Hospital and a, a mentor of mine, um, over 20 years ago, he discovered that uh, people of First Nations heritage were requiring liver transplants more than transplants for any other organ. And given that the national mandate uh, for much of the next 20 years was that nobody could have a transplant if there was any suspicion of alcohol consumption in the last six months. You couldn't just explain, a explain away that disparity by saying it must be because of drinking. So this study was uh, implemented to look for reasons why this might be. For those of you out there um, who are uh, physicians or caregivers in the know, this is a bit nostalgic because if you look on the left, it's the collection of all of the uh, reasons for transplant in British Columbia for a 10 year period. And hepatitis C is at the top. I mean, obviously that's not the way it is anymore with treatments being uh, really um, short and efficacious and safe compared to what it was 20 years ago. But the important thing to keep in mind is in this list, PBC was number two at 18% of all transplant patients. That was for everybody in the, in the province. Now, if you separated it out and look not just at the general BC population, but just at those of First Nations heritage, PBC was the number one cause and it was 50% of all the people who needed a transplant for this reason. So 18% of British Columbians who needed a liver transplant was for PBC, but 50% of those who were from First Nations required it. Why is this happening? That's a very strong disparity. Why is this happening? Well, it gets even more interesting from there, which is two thirds of all the First Nations PBC patients come from two specific families of bands, the Salishan or the Nuka. And for those of you who don't live here in British Columbia or specifically Vancouver Island, um, the Salishan families and the Nuka families are predominantly on Vancouver Island itself, not on the mainland. Uh, they also exist along the Alaskan archipelago as well. Uh, the reason this is important is, as I'm going to get to here, so Vancouver, a little word about Vancouver Island where I live, other than the fact that it's beautiful and uh, way too expensive now, is we make up just a little less than a fifth of the entire population of the province. And First Nations here are proportionately, are proportionately represented. They also make up almost a fifth of the population of First Nations in the province. PBC cases uh, on the island are roughly one fifth of all cases in the province. 
except for those amongst First Nations. Nearly half of all First Nations cases of PBC occur on Vancouver Island. From this data, Dr. Yoshida and geneticist Dr. Arbor were able to conclude that the coastal nations were more than eight times as likely to get PBC than the general population of the province itself. And this data is actually mirrored in American data showcasing uh, the First Nations of coastal heritage in Alaska versus those living more inward or the general population as well. So knowing that information, we take that 30,000 view, we can make a very crude calculation that showcases the prevalence across Canada, and you see the number in red. So for coastal First Nations, the prevalence of, of PBC is exponentially higher than for the general population of this province, let alone the country. So is it genetics? Is it environment? We've seen that there's increased cases on both coasts and we've ex we have potential explanations for both which seem to indicate heritability, but could environment play a role? It's hard to say. To, me, to further muddy the waters, there are uh, similarities uh, between these two very different groups, the First Nations groups that have PBC and the uh, Western groups who have PBC, which is for both of these groups, um, there is much higher uh, rates of getting this disease amongst first degree relatives. So therefore, if you have PBC, you're probably aware of this, one of your, you know, one of your siblings or children are much more likely to also get it than someone of the general population. Uh, there was an old study in the United Kingdom that really showcases this well. In that study, the, the, the prevalence of PBC in the UK at large was 390 per million people. If you had PBC, then the prevalence for one of your first degree relatives almost doubled. If that first degree relative was female, the prevalence doubled again, so quadrupled the natural average. If that first degree relative happened to be the daughter of a mother with PBC, it goes higher even still. So we're seeing in this case that PBC behaves similarly um, amongst uh, different ethnic groups uh, here. One thing to keep in mind that does distinguish the First Nations PBC patients from uh, Western PBC patients is that uh, in First Nations, they're often much younger at the time of diagnosis and at the age of being referred for transplant. Um, and I do have something to, to mention about that that I couldn't incorporate into my presentation. So I apologize, but hopefully during the question period, I can bring that up. And also, you know, we know classically that uh, females are much more likely, roughly eight to nine times more likely to get PBC than men. That ratio is amplified even further still towards women in First Nations than it is in general population. And the other, the other similarity that we see uh, amongst First Nations and Western uh, peoples with uh, PBC is both groups are much more likely to uh, acquire another autoimmune disease if they already have PBC. In the case of uh, First Nations groups, uh, a majority of them develop rheumatoid arthritis and still a plurality of them can develop thyroid or lupus or other abnormalities. Interestingly, if a First Nations patient has PBC, their first degree relatives have a one in five chance, not, not, not of getting PBC, but of simply of getting one of the other conditions I just listed above. And similar statistics exist from data that was called for Western populations in the United States and in France. So we've talked about um, the possibility of uh, how geography plays a role, the possibility that heritage plays a role. And I kind of hinted at prevalence rates going up over time because Perhaps we're getting, um, we as in physicians and in patients are all much more aware of this condition and what to look for. Are we ignoring something? And I think there's something we need to discuss while I end this, while I end this talk. For all of you out there who have PBC, ask yourselves this, how long did it take from the time you first had symptoms and presented to your doctor or first were told about blood test abnormalities by your doctor to the time you were given this actual diagnosis? How many times were you told you need to cut down on your alcohol intake? That's the cause. So that is still the big bugaboo. And it doesn't, and, and this is indiscriminate. It doesn't matter if you're First Nations or Western or where you come from. This is still a prevailing sentiment. And to prove, and just to give you an idea of how prevailing this is, up until the middle of the last, up until the middle of the last decade, in British Columbia and in a few other provinces, the statistic agencies that recorded causes of death. Anything that was death by liver was automatically written as alcohol related, automatically. 
Alcohol is roughly the cause of one in five cases of cirrhosis in Canada. That's four, that means four to five cases or something else. So that's an example of systemic um, underrepresentation, I guess, or systemic under, under a misunderstanding of the uh, complexity and the variability of liver diseases. Another thing to point out here too, in, uh, just to help uh, quell the stereotype of alcohol in First Nations, that stereotype comes from data that does show, yes, amongst First Nations, those who drink tend to drink, tend to consume more than the average Westerner, but taken as a whole, far fewer people of First Nations consume alcohol than do Western peoples. And so, for example, we know enough from uh, education uh, that occurred in the 1980s that if someone's complaining of chest pain or having a heart attack, we don't automatically say, oh, you just have to cut out your smoking and you're gonna get better. We, that may be a risk factor, but we don't automatically assume that's, just, that's the single causative agent. So we need to have the same level of awareness for liver disease, which is just because you have a liver condition, we don't automatically assume it has to be from one of these three lovely beverages or four or five or however many that is, that's the sole cause. And um, I by doing, and the reason I bring this up is because I've had quite a few anecdotal uh, experience with my patients where there's a degree of shame to come forward. We want to screen people at fairly large volumes here in Vancouver Island because of the high prevalence in coastal First Nations. And the problem isn't uh, engagement with physicians. It's patients are often ashamed, not of being told by me necessarily or another physician, oh, you must be drinking too much. There's an assumption that if they're being seen by a liver specialist, even amongst their own inner circle of friends, it must be because of alcohol. And often that acts as a barrier. So uh, that's the end of my little spiel on trying to get to promote uh, increased liver awareness and getting people screened for PBC in my little neck of the woods. And just to summarize, as I mentioned before, PBC disproportionately impacts Canada's first nations along the coast of uh, Vancouver Island and British Columbia. It does occur more often than the national average in the Atlantic provinces. That's thought to be due to founder effect. And the key word here is first nations, not nation. Just as there are various, just because, just as there's tons of uh, variability amongst Western populations slash Caucasian populations, same thing applies to first nations. Specific populations are at much higher risk of getting this along the coast, much, much higher than other first nations that live inland in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, or elsewhere. And, uh, Thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, JP. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, JP, can you hear me? I can. Good. I'm going to give you some questions now. Um, one of the questions is, uh, we know like environmental factors can be um, like toxic waste sites, but a lot of people have been uh, told that nail polish and hair dyes also can... Uh, can increase the chances of getting PVC. How, is there any science to that? There actually has been some science looking into that, but actually, essentially those factors have been debunked in the only data that's been made available uh, quite a few years ago. I didn't reference it. I didn't reference it here because simply because it's been found that there's been no direct correlation uh, for those things. But yes, it has at least been, it has been looked at at least in one major paper. Um, thank you. Has there been any um, correlation between uh, the, the national data of the different countries and uh, national diet? Not to my knowledge, there has not been. I don't think, I don't know of any large scale study that's tied diet to PBC, or, uh, PBC uh, prevalence, certainly nothing to uh, compare one country to another. Maybe Alia can tell me otherwise, but I, I'm not familiar with that. No, I agree. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any data to that. Okay. And, um, are we seeing uh, an increase in uh, the PBC numbers? Uh, you sort of alluded to it, but ha have we actually seen like more cases being diagnosed? No, we have. Um, I didn't have a chance to specifically mention it in, um, in one of my slides here. Let me just see if I can't pull it up again uh, here. So maybe you guys can see this. Can you guys still hear me? So yes. as in this slide, along the bottom right, um, that's data taken from the Eric Yoshida poster from 2018, showing the national uh, transplant prevalence versus the national disease prevalence. So that 1.03, 0 0.59, 0 0.58, that's the transplant prevalence rates dropping over time. 
and the 255, 288, 388 per million, that's the prevalence rates. through the Facebook comments to see if I can. Uh, there's a lot of questions, but I think we're going to have to save some of them till our next session about uh, symptoms. Um, now, have you heard of anything uh, causal in terms of uh, medications that people take? One, Carol from New Brunswick says she was told her PBC was due to an allergy to penicillin. Like most, like most things, there's been a lot of things that have been speculated about. I speculated myself about various environmental factors, um, but no, there's been nothing conclusive. Um, autoimmune diseases at large often, or whatever those PBC or what has to do with other organs of the body, there's, there's still a, a theory that's pervasive called molecular mimicry, meaning maybe if you're exposed to something, whether it's foreign, whether it's uh, such as a medication or anything else, the immune system gloms onto it and it's similar enough to something within your own body that the immune system then chooses to attack it too. That's just a theory. There's no proof behind that for PBC. Um, there's, there's been no conclusive proof that any antibiotic or any medication can trigger it. Thank you. Um, and one other uh, question. Um, do you think PBC is uh, underdiagnosed? Do you think there's um, maybe more people out there that have it? It's less rare than we think? Well, I can only speak for my neck of the woods here, but I certainly believe it is underdiagnosed, underdiagnosed without question. Um, I do a lot of um, outreach with uh, the First Nations Health Authority and go to a few different First Nations clinics. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for screening people, but it's not always easy to get people to, to, to um, get screened by their primary caregivers for a multitude of reasons. Um, but every time that we kind of get mass screening, we pick up a lot of new cases. Now, maybe this is within the prevalence rates, but the point is I've seen my, my, uh, my practice rates of PBC jump significantly when I do these, these uh, outreach. Okay, and the last question we have for you is, uh, do you recommend that uh, people with PBC have their children tested? And if so, under what circumstances? I think if you have PBC, um, I, I, so PBC is not a pediatric disease. So specifically, if you have children and they're, st they're still of you know, pediatric age, there's really no point in having them tested because they're not going to manifest it until later anyway, if they get it at all. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is certainly family members are higher risk. All that really needs to be done um, essentially is for the family doctor or primary caregiver of, that, of, of the family member to make sure that they do, you know, screening liver biochemistry at least once per year. You know, I don't recommend I don't recommend screening with anti mitochondrial antibody necessarily because without the context of the cold, of the liver markers, that doesn't tell us enough necessarily. You you can have um, disease with uh, the marker being elevated and with the classic alkaline phosphates being uh, normal. Uh, recently at Easel, there was some paperwork showing that. Um, Elevated GGT alone may be enough to uh, showcase active PBC activity, but for screening purposes, all that needs to happen is if you're a family member of an affected person, when you're into your 30s or 40s, particularly if you're female, just having at least annual liver biochemistry done is suitable enough to follow if you're go likely going to pick it, get this. Okay, thank you so much, JP, for... Uh that great talk. And now I would like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Aliyah. Um, she can share her screen. That's great. Perfect. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks. I don't know why this went Backward. Okay, so thanks, um, Gail, and thanks to everybody for joining. Um, thanks, JP, for a great talk. I agree with 
um, lots of what was discussed. And I think that these are two very complementary talks. So you may see some overlapping points, but I think that they will be complementary, like I said. Um, so the title of my talk um, is A Foray into Risk Assessment, but we'll talk a little bit about um, in terms of an outline, sort of the nature versus nurture of PVC. Um, I'll go on to talk about risk factors related to PVC, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the Canadian Autoimmune Liver Disease Network and some of the research that we've done um, that, has that has used um, impressive collaborations from around the country to sort of um, showcase our Canadian uh, PVC data. So just in terms of PVC, so what is PVC? Everyone, always, when I see a new patient in the clinic, um, I try to describe the, describe the disease itself. We talk about why does PVC happen? And then I think patients most often um, wonder and worry about what are we gonna do about it? What are we gonna do about it now? And what are we gonna do about it moving forward? Not only to help me, but to help the PVC community at large to sort of tackle this disease. And then um, how that those um, questions turn into research that leads to new therapies. So I, I like to sort of go through this slide when I'm presenting about PBC, just so that we understand where the inflammatory disease comes from. So in the top left, you can see a picture of the liver, which sits in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen and the green um, figures are the gallbladder and the bile ducts. And each of these subsequent figures are just magnifications of that. So the, the middle on the bottom middle part of the slide, you can see a cross section of the liver where the bile ducts sort of sit in between the liver cells um, and they're in charge of transporting bile or bilirubin that's made in the liver into the bile ducts and subsequently into the um, the bowels. And in the on the top right, you can see the bile ducts really zoomed in upon. And I like to show this picture so that patients and other clinicians understand that when you get inflammation of the bile ducts or of the green areas, that's right next to liver cells too. So you get inflammation not only of the bile ducts, but also of the adjacent liver cells, which is why the blood test can sometimes look like inflammation in the biliary parameters like the ALP and GGT, but also in the transaminases like the AST and the ALT. So what is PVC? So we all know that PVC used to be called primary biliary cirrhosis, but that through patient advocacy especially was changed into primary biliary cholangitis because cholangitis means inflammation of the bile ducts. And in fact, the vast majority of patients do not have cirrhosis. So just because you're diagnosed with P uh, BC does not mean you have cirrhosis. And in fact, the majority of people do not. And we know that PVC is just one of a family of autoimmune conditions um, that are very different in and of themselves, but can have some similarities. And that includes the other conditions, including autoimmune hepatitis and PSC or primary sclerosing cholangitis. So why does PBC happen? This is the age old question. And while I think our answers sort of are general and can be dated back for years now, I think we're understanding a little bit more about the molecular changes that happen in PBC. So these are just pictures to show that um, what causes the inflammation of the bile ducts, which are the cells you can see along the bottom of the slides, is really the immune system becoming dysregulated. So the immune system is composed of different arms, the innate system and the adaptive system, and both of those systems become dysregulated and result in inflammation of the bile ducts. And this is a complex figure, not that necessarily that you really need to know the details of it, but was published um, by our group just earlier this year. Um, and what I wanted to draw your attention to was something JP was speaking about in the, in the top left. So this is where you get these microbial mimics. So what is a microbial mimic or an environmental mimic? So that's an environmental antigen or something in the environment that mimics something in your own body that triggers the immune system. So normally the immune system is supposed to be tolerant to your own cells. It's not supposed to react against your own cells. But after exposure to something perhaps in the environment, a marker gets placed on the immune cells that triggers immune dysregulation. And that leads to that cascade of immune activity that leads to inflammation of the bile ducts. So why does the disease develop? And 
Over time, we've learned that it's likely a combination of a genetic predisposition and an environmental trigger. So many people may be exposed to the same environmental antigen, but unless you have an underlying genetic predisposition, um, perhaps the disease won't manifest. And so we think about it kind of like a Swiss cheese model where all the holes have to line up for the disease to become fully manifest. Um, but what that trigger is for disease to develop is not really 100% clear. And to JP's point, there's lots of environmental triggers that have been um, reported on and some with real biologic plausibility. And that ranges from things like urinary tract infections, which might just be associated because more women have urinary tract infections, but also things like hormone replacement therapy, smoking history, and like JP mentioned, toxic waste sites. The genetics of PBC are very, very complicated. And if you look at any genetics paper, you'll, uh, you'll see a picture that looks like this, which is very aesthetically appealing, but what does it mean? It just means that if you see in the middle, there's a long red bar, a thin long red bar, that is the gene that's most heavily associated with PBC. So it doesn't mean there's many, many, many genes in the body, but not all of the genes are associated with PBC. It's primarily genes that are at this chromosome six, which is the Immune, modulate, uh, immune modulatory region of the genetic, um, the genetic code, uh, which tends to be associated with immune mediated diseases. So while there's lots of genes that have been associated with PBC, the most common one is at this locus called HLA-DQ. But there's um, different genes associated with lots of different immune conditions. And so we know that even the genes that are associated with PBC aren't limited to associations with PBC. These immune mediated diseases often share the same genetic predisposition. So there, the, on the left of this chart, you can see genes that have been associated with PBC, but those same genes have also been associated with other autoimmune conditions. Um, and that just goes to um, emphasize the point that we know clinically that many patients who have PBC have other autoimmune conditions. But it also tells us that genes are important, but not the whole story. You don't, just a genetic um, change does not mean disease will develop. So why does it develop? It's likely this synergy between an environmental trigger and a genetically susceptible host. And that is what I meant by these nature versus nurture interactions. It's not one or the other. It may be and likely is a combination of both. And even the genetic changes that we see are not necessarily something that you can get your genes genotyped and see the cause. It may be changes in the genetic landscape that are known as epigenetic changes or structural rearrangements that aren't necessarily just, here's my DNA, what's the abnormality? It's subtle changes in the architecture that may be associated with disease developing. And this table speaks to something that um, JP was talking about, but the environmental antigens that have been associated with PBC. So the geographical location, like the toxic waste sites, um, in New York and some industrial urban regions in, in Newcastle in the UK. But smoking and certain bacteria, um, speaking to the urinary tract infection um, association and certain xenobiotics or certain chemicals that can be found in things like lipstick and nail polishes and things like that. The reason they've been associated with PVC development is they structurally they structurally look similar to some molecules in the body and they can act like mimics. So are they definite associations? No, absolutely not. They're not definite associations. But these are just substances that when people have studied these molecules and they have injected them into mice, for example, PBC-like phenotypes have developed. So are these classic for developing PBC? Should you never wear lipstick? Should you never wear nail polish? No, absolutely not. Um, these are just sort of um, potential um, theories that can be associated, people have looked for environmental um, antigens. So 
I'm glad we, this question came up about uh, family members and risk in PVC. I think this literature has uh, been quite variable over the course of years. So this is a study that we did while I was doing my fellowship um, in, in Minnesota a couple of years ago. And it looked at what's the risk of PVC in first degree relatives who have an AMA that's positive. So not just first degree relatives on its own to what JP was speaking about, but if you look at first degree relatives of patients with PVC, so that sisters, daughters, um, mothers, um, and they have a positive AMA, what's the chance that they're going to develop PVC? And you would think it's really high. And it, the truth is it may be really high, but in this study that we did that started off with 476 PVC patients, we had a, a, um, a group of about 40 first degree relatives who were AMA positive, um, who had normal liver tests, and only about 4% of them developed PVC. That's 10% more than, or 10 times more than first degree relatives who did not have an AMA that was positive, but still it's not 100% or it's not 50% even. 4% of patients who are AMA positive, of first degree relatives who are AMA positive went on to develop PBC. So while the risk is higher, it's not complete. So let's move on to risk assessment. I think Gail's gonna kill me because I might run out of time, but I'll, squeeze, I'll, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Um, and I wanted to emphasize this point. This is the same slide that I show to many of my colleagues to say that risk assessment in PVC is multifactorial. It's not just about incomplete response to URSO as we're so um, well aware of identifying, but it also relates to one's age at diagnosis. So I always think of someone at risk of PVC um, complications when they're diagnosed at less than 50 years old and when they have significant amount of fibrosis in their liver at diagnosis. And we know that incomplete response to URSO is important. This is a slide that you see over and over again in presentations that in patients who have a good response to URSO, their prognosis is very good and may be equal to that of the general population. But it's the patients who have an incomplete response to URSO that we know we need to, um, to focus on in terms of outcomes to prevent the development of poor liver related outcomes. And the reason I say that age is important is because we know that URSO works. URSO, URSO absolutely works. It is an amazing drug for patients with PBC, but we know that it doesn't stop the disease. It slows down the disease. And I use this slide to emphasize this point, that if you look at the bar graph on the side, um, as you age, even in patients who have a complete response to URSO or a good response to URSO, the risk of outcomes is still there. And that means that when you're diagnosed, when you're less than 50 years old, you have a long time to live with your native liver, and we need to maximize that time and prevent the liver-related outcomes, because URSO will slow things down, but it doesn't necessarily halt the disease. And this is a, um, a graph just to show that fibrosis stage also matters when it comes to patients with PVC. So you can just pay attention to sort of the graph on the right, where the blue line means you have very minimal fibrosis, and the red line means you have advanced fibrosis. And the difference is in the outcomes in patients with PVC. So in patients who have more advanced disease, they're at risk of worse outcomes. So when we've identified a patient who's at high risk, then what do we do? So phenotyping a patient means understanding their disease, understanding their risk profile, i.e. their age, their response, and their um, fibrosis stage. And then we have to decide how are we going to treat them best. And it's with understanding those patients that are at highest risk that we know which patients to target for clinical trials. So this is data from the POISE study, which was the um, first phase three study that looked at um, um, obetacolic acid in patients with PVC and showed that obetacolic acid improves biochemical markers of liver disease, i.e. alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin in patients who have an incomplete response to URSO. So whereas only 10% or so of patients in the placebo group had a response on the, in this study, almost 50% of patients who were treated with obetacolic acid had an improvement in their liver tests. And these findings, as we accumulate more data, um, are increasingly being published that these, um, these biochemical results are sustainable out to 72 months. So this led to a lot of the effort that we've um, 
done over the course of the last year to use our Canadian network for autoimmune liver disease to understand what's the rate of response to obeta-colic acid in our own patients, because clinical trials are one thing, but not all patients participate in clinical trials. So what about the patients that don't participate that we see in our clinic on a day-to-day -day basis? And this is the power of these um, collaborations that we've spearheaded so when, when obeta-colic acid came on the market, we decided to be very intentional about um, collecting data and looking at biochemistries over time. And I hope this animation works. It's not perfect because it keeps repeating itself. Um, but this just goes to show that in our real world cohort of patients with P uh, PBC treated with obeta-colic acid across the country, there was a significant reduction in alkaline phosphatase and ALT in patients who were treated with this drug. So not only to show that this drug worked in a clinical trial, but it works in our patients um, day to day. And this was actually the first experience that was published um, and it was accepted to a journal called Hepatology Communications not that long ago. And when you look at safety, the bilirubin level, which is a measure of safety, appeared to be very stable over time. So in our patients in this period of follow-up of 19 months, um, the drug appeared to be effective and safe when used in the right setting. And this just shows very similar data to what was seen in the clinical trial, the proportion of patients who achieve the endpoint that we want them to achieve, that reduction in alkaline phosphatase by more than 15% from where they started. And in our cohort, that was about 40% of patients after 19 months of therapy. So very similar to the clinical trial, which was very encouraging, I think. And more and more as we see data coming from all around the world, we see this data sort of mimicked. People are finding very similar data to what we found. And now we're moving on from our um, national experience to being on the world stage. So we're currently putting together the global PBC study group data, which is looking at obeta-colic acid in patients with PBC. And you'll see the markers of liver inflammation, the biochemistries um, all improve similar to the, the graphs that I just showed you, similar to what we saw in our Canadian cohort and markers of safety, i.e. bilirubin platelets and albumin all remain stable. So these are just pictures to, to emphasize that point that alkaline phosphatase in patients treated with obeta-colic acid in the real world declined significantly and bilirubin remained normal. But we know that blood tests aren't everything. I mean, I tell the fellows every single time they're in clinic with me that it's not all about blood tests. We don't treat blood tests, we treat people and their disease is more than just what they're fiber scans look like and what their blood tests look like. Symptom burden is really important to think about. And I think that's where the field is really moving in terms of next um, steps for therapeutic advances. I think that's really an unmet need in patients with PBC. But this data is was presented as, I believe it was easel this year. Um, it may have been ASLD, but by one of our master's students that looks at symptom burden in patients with PBC and looks at how that varies across different ethnicities. Um, and you can see here to JP's point about the, the prevalence of uh, aggressive PBC also in indigenous populations, the symptom burden correlates that with um, far more patients with, um, with an indigenous, from an indigenous background describing more severe symptoms, be that itch, fatigue, cognitive or socio-emotional socio impact when we looked at uh, questionnaires, including the PBC-40. So this data is currently um, being analyzed further, but it's only through these collaborative efforts like CANAL um, that we can get this data. Canada is very fortunate in being a very multicultural, ethnically diverse, um, having an ethnic, ethnically diverse population. And so we are able to sort of see these subtle changes in symptom complexes and disease manifestations across the spectrum. And this just sort of is the overlay of severity of symptoms by ethnicity. And the numbers are not so big, but you can see the broader um, is it hexagons or pentagons? The broader <laughs> pentagons um, are indicative of more severe symptoms and the, the sort of symptoms that you can see are outlined there in uh, symptom, symptomatic disease in general, and then itch, fatigue, cognitive impact, and socio-emotional socio impact. And you can see the, the biggest pentagon is that from the indigenous population. 
So that's all I had to say. Maybe I didn't go over time. I think I'm right on time, actually. Um, so with that, I thank you, um, everyone, for attending. I had a great time. Thanks to JP and Gail, and I'm happy to take questions. OK, that's great. Wow, you just came in right on time. Um, you didn't talk uh, too much about men. I know that um, men seem to have a harder time with PVC than women. I know not too many men get this, but it, uh, could you talk a little bit about men getting PVC? Yeah, it's a question that comes up. I'm sorry, I should have included that, but um, it's a question that comes up often. And I think one of the confusing parts is that the literature is so variable. And a part of that is because um, because PVC occurs infrequently in men. So there is some data to say phenotypically the disease is the same in, pa in patients with PVC who are male and female, but there is some data to say that PVC is more aggressive or um, at risk of more complications in men. And I think some of the evidence will say that this is likely related to delays in diagnosis and later diagnosis and presentation. Um, to JP's point, sometimes um, it's assumed that males who have elevated liver tests um, are sort of stereotypically considered to have fatty liver, whether that be from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or alcohol-related fatty liver disease. And rare female predominant conditions aren't tested for. So it may be diagnosed later and present later, which leads to more complications. Thank you. Um, you were talking about um, current treatments, uh, ortho and OCA. And I'm wondering if there's any research that is looking at um, treatments that would address autoimmunity. Underlying autoimmunity. Well, that's a fascinating question. So I think one of the issues with addressing underlying autoimmunity is you have to um, know what your target is, right? So we, I think if we understood what the trigger was for triggering the immune response, that's one step you can target. But until you understand what the trigger is, um, widespread suppression of the immune system is also not a great thing, right? Um, that can have its own set of consequences. So I think targeted therapy would be wonderful. I think broad-based immunosuppressive therapy is probably not necessary in PVC and may be more harmful. Thank you. Um, do you think in the future, PVC uh, will be uh, diagnosed with different types, like how diabetes is type one, type two? you see that for the future? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, I'm not sure whether different types will be diagnosed. It's possible. There are certainly different phenotypes that we see in the clinic, but I think more and more you'll hear the terminology of high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk PVC, um, and that will stratify um, how aggressive to treat biochemical changes. So I'm, I, I don't think so much we'll move towards a type one and type two only because those sort of divisions aren't natural in PVC, but risk divisions are for sure. Okay, that leads me to my last question, which is um, for risk. When you uh, speak to patients, uh, sometimes we hear, um, patients are told you have, are five years away from a transplant or now you're two years away from a transplant. What factors go into assessing and uh, communicating that to patients? Yeah, that's, I mean, I think communication is so, so, so important and rests in the hands of a good therapeutic relationship with your physician. And nobody has a crystal ball in life. I tell patients that all the time. We, um, it would be wonderful if we had numbers that were perfectly accurate, but the studies that tell us about these numbers are based on population level data, none of which the individual patient is oftentimes a part of in terms of contributing. So I tell patients that we can use models to understand what their risk is, but this is just a model and it's a prediction. It doesn't mean that that's true for that individual. So I like to go through um, scoring systems like the GLOBE score, the UK PBC risk score, which you can use online yourself and you can ask your clinician to go through with you on the computer. It takes five minutes to do, but it gives you what someone's um, predicted risk of transplant is over the course of five, 10 and 15 years. And I think that that's really helpful for clinicians to understand risk, but for patients also to understand what their magnitude of risk is in the short, medium and long term. Thank you. Uh, I've actually in the, uh, PD, in the 
Facebook uh, comment. I've put a link to the Globe score, the Globe risk score. So uh, if anyone's interested in checking that out, um, I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, I want to thank both our speakers. Uh, really, um, thank you so much for presenting uh, the data that you would really be discussing among your peers, because I think so many uh, PBC patients uh, crave this type of in-depth knowledge. Um, otherwise, they all just go uh, read our brochure. <laughs> so, um, so I really want to thank you for really delving deeply into the science and the studies. And we really appreciate everything you do uh, to educate us. And um, of course, uh, you're wonderful clinicians. And I know you stand um, up for your patients. So uh, thank you for that. Our next session is uh, next Wednesday. It will deal with uh, fatigue and symptoms and um, some of the wonderful work that we're doing here in Canada in terms of uh, studying fatigue it will be Dr. Swain. Uh, and all of these sessions, if you miss us live, uh, they stay on our Facebook page. You can re-watch it. And um, we also post them on our YouTube channel. And in that case, you can um, slow down and look at some of the more detailed slides on a bigger screen and more carefully. Um, so hopefully um, you can uh, grab all the information. I wanna thank everyone who tuned in tonight. We've had a big audience tonight and uh, feel free to share the videos and this, the link to the uh, Facebook and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you both. And thank you for everyone who joined us. <laughs>